This is going to be a single slide presentation. That is, the slide that you're looking at right now is going to be the entire presentation. Um, now, I want to explain this in light of physics and in light of the laws that we know about thermodynamics and light and how they work and behave. And what, these lines that uh, come up to the left are called Planck curves. And Planck explained these laws uh, try, trying to understand how much light is given off by a uh, given given object at a given wavelength per area unit that's uh, being considered and uh, you can see on the left here the spe spectral uh, radiant uh, emittance is measured in uh, watts given off in the, those frequencies uh, per meter squared uh, measured in microns. So um, I'm not a big fan of quantum physics because it's based on the wrong theory that is a theory that space is a vacuum and that light travels through nothing at all. In other words, there's no medium needed for light and I think this is wrong. However, uh, Planck announced that in uh, 1900 he could describe the emissions from a black body uh, by his formulas and that it was uh, it remained the predominant theory of physics ever since so uh, over a century and, and a tenth now we have uh, we've used the uh, his formulas and others of course uh, that have been developed around that now the reason that's uh, unusual is that uh, every particle known uh, travels through some kind of a media that's how it gets from point A to point B through a media, and it it creates a a a, a, a wave pattern as it goes through that. Correct? I mean, a, a boat traveling through water produces waves. Here with physics, they decided that wasn't the case. That there wasn't a, a an ether that you couldn't detect. They laughed that theory out of existence uh, and said, no, that, that can't be the case. Uh, there isn't this ether, this magic ether that we all pass through. And so light is passing actually through a vacuum. Uh, that's the theory, at least, of course, until Einstein realized that his theories didn't account for the movements of the universe itself. And he missed 95 plus percent of the mass of the universe by his theories that negated the idea of ether. So this is the reason that, that uh, dark energy, dark matter have now replaced ether theory. It's exactly the same theory uh, uh, to uh, explain uh, that those that mass of the universe. And this gives light a uh, a medium in which it can travel, and that's that's my theory. But but so so uh, quantum theory is trying to explain the wave actions of things and how light behaves because they they don't have a medium through which light travels. So I, I really do think that the quantum physics, as accurate as it is, will be replaced by uh, other theories in the future, and that's starting to happen right now, and uh, that's gaining momentum. But anyways, so uh, Max Max Planck. Um, propose that all material systems can absorb or give off electromagnetic radiation only in chunks or quanta of energy or packets of energy a certain of a certain amount uh, that was represented by the symbol E as a, as a quanta of energy and that these are proportional to the frequency of that radiation so uh, so this uh, became E equals H as the representative symbol so Planck's constant is simply H so his radical insight is that the uh, the quantitative aspects of an incandescent radiation constitute the radiation laws that we need to explain a body's thermal energy. And it turns out this this is any body, any body in the physical universe, uh, any physical mass in the in the universe can be uh, understood at least partly the temperature can be understood or detected by the wavelength of light and the amount of each wavelength of light that are, are given off that it gives off okay so now I realize several things a black body is a body that that absorbs every bit of of uh, photonic energy that uh, that hits it and it 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 uh, freely passes through its surface every bit that is transmitted up to that surface. Those don't exist. They actually don't exist. This is a, it's, a, it's a theory of what it would be like if it passed everything, but it doesn't. So that's why we have to consider emissivity. There are no actual black bodies, but this is what it would look like if there were. Okay, so um, uh, after that, uh, 
Josef Stefan found in, in, I think it was Austria, and found in 1879 that the total radiation energy per unit of time emitted by a heated surface uh, per unit area increases uh, to the fourth power of its absolute temperature in kelvins. Okay, this means that the sun's surface, which is uh, somewhere between what's shown here, um, 5,777 degrees Kelvin, and about 65,000 Kelvin, and that's why you'll see uh, 6,500K light bulbs, especially if you're in aquariums like I am, you'll see them, uh, they, you know, it's a 6,500K light bulb. It means it gives off the right spectrum of radiation, and that's the most uh, volume that it gives off is in the right spectrum, okay? So, uh, sun surface is somewhere in that. Let's say it's 6,000 uh, 6, Kelvin. Uh, that would give an area, you take 6,000 divided by 300, multiply that times 4, equals uh, 204, and uh, that's equal to 160,000 times more electromagnetic energy given off than the same area, uh, the similar area, let's say a square meter, of the Earth's surface, which is taken to be 300 degrees Kelvin. Okay, let's moving along before we get completely in, engulfed in the chart. Then in about uh, 1889, Ludwig Boltzmann, uh, another Austrian, uh, used the second law of thermodynamics to derive his temperatures, uh, uh, temperature dependence for a black body. And while it was important to understand that, again, a black body doesn't, doesn't really exist, but Boltzmann and Stefan uh, found that uh, uh, certain properties of those black bodies, and, and we'll get to that in the lower left-hand corner in a few minutes. Okay, but the wavelength or the frequency uh, distribution of a black body radiation, it was studied in the 1890s, a little bit earlier than that, by the German physicist Wilhelm Wien. Right? Well, uh, I, I'm sorry, this is a little bit later than uh, Stefan and Boltzmann, earlier than Planck, uh, um, by, by Wilhelm Wien. So we have Wien's law, and that's what you find here at the top of the curve, representing the, the, the uh, orangish or yellowish curve, representing uh, sunlight's frequencies, right, and its, its distribution of energy. So uh, Wien found that the radiative energy of uh, uh, per wavelength interval was the maximum emission of a certain wavelength at the, at the maximum, and that that maximum shifts to the shorter wavelength, to the left on this chart, as the temperature rises. Okay, so Wien's laws would describe that peak energy and Planck's curves resulting from that. He's trying to explain how that would work uh, as an item got hotter. What would the, the shift in the wavelength, how much uh, of each frequency would be given off, and that increases. Okay, now realize on here, each frequency is a vertical line on this chart. So if a, if a body is giving off more of that specific frequency, it's because it's hotter, right? And that, that, uh, that peak can be, uh, can be described by, Wien's Law describes the peak energy, or the max energy given off by that, um, uh, by that object, and that's where we can know that. Okay, so uh, we'll get again get to that in just a second. But basically, he said, look, it, you know, when something reaches about 950 degrees Kelvin, it starts glowing a dim red, and then that becomes, uh, as it becomes hotter, that red becomes more orange, and then shifts more towards yellow, then green, blue, purples. Okay, that's the direction. It, that's how you can tell how hot an object is now. How does that work if you're working thermography? Well, many years ago, uh, we were on a ship. Matter of fact, it was the um, Kitty Hawk, US, um, USNS, or USN Kitty Hawk. Uh, and on the Kitty Hawk, a technician asked us to look at the elevator uh, contacts. And the elevator contacts on this, you may think of a real fine contact on a a little electric switch or something. No, these things weighed, you know, uh, 50, 60 pounds. There were a lot of steel, a lot of, a lot of energy going through this. And as we were uh, turning on the camera, cooling it off because it was an old, um, very large camera that uh, you had to put uh, liquid nitrogen in the door to cool off the background radiation. You had to warm up the the computer, and it took several minutes and all this. I looked down and the object was glowing red. Well, at that point, we knew it was over 950 degrees Kelvin because that's where that red light starts to be given off. Okay, now if that had turned, if it had gotten hotter and hotter, what would have happened? It would have turned orange and then yellow, and 
more kind of a white, uh, white appearance. White is, of course, a mixture of all of those colors, and and uh, all the the color range, the color spectrum. Would it become brighter and brighter? Now, of course, at some point that would have failed. It would have it would have uh, fused the the uh, contact itself would have fused together, and it would have been uh, 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 permanently stuck. That wouldn't have been good. So we we had the guy turn that off, of course, and uh, and shot it and and reported the problem, and basically just need to be taken a taken apart and cleaned. But we see that in a tungsten filament of the incandescent lights that you may still have, no longer legal to be made in the United States, but uh, we're, we live in a free country, so it's uh, you, you can't make these in the United States anymore. But when when that filament starts to glow red, you can tell it's 950 degrees Kelvin, and then of course it, it gets much hotter than that, and so it uh, at about oh. Uh, for the three, four, five thousand degrees, you have a, a yellowish uh, light, which which are the, uh, the the typical orange or yellowish glow of the tungsten. What you don't realize until you touch that bulb is that most of the energy, the peak energy, is still in the infrared. It's still given off as heat. Touch that bulb, and you'll find that out real quickly. Okay, now uh, that means that everything that has light in the visible range is in those temperature ranges. That's physics. You can't ex you can't break that. Now you say that an LED is cool, but an LED is cool because mm, well, something like 98, 99 percent of the energy that goes through it is converted directly to light, and it's in the visible range. Okay, so these curves that you see are much steeper for an LED. It gets up to that range and then emits light almost all in the, the, uh, in the uh, visible range. And that's why it's cool. And that's why it's so an efficient uh, lighting source. So there's no exception to this. Even your fluorescent bulbs, uh, the, the very surface of it itself, when it's hit by that ionized uh, uh, particle, uh, glows and it glows at those temperatures, it wouldn't give off the specific light that each a neon bulb is. It just wouldn't. Okay, These, these are laws of physics, not rules. The, this is uh, not something you can break. Okay, so the, the wavelength or frequency distribution of, in black body, um, uh, a black body radiator, again, was, uh, was studied by, by Wien, and, and uh, that's where Wien's law comes from, which you see at the top of that arch right there. Now, Wien's law of the shift of radiative power uh, um, to higher frequencies that the temperature is raised expresses a, a quantitative form common to the commonplace observer or observations. Uh, warm objects emit again. Infrared radiation is felt by the skin and then starting to be able to be detected by the eye in the 950 degree Kelvin range and then uh, again it, it shifts brighter and brighter and brighter until it's uh, it's glowing white and then uh, more energy provided it goes blue uh, and then more than that it, it goes into higher than we can even see into the microwave range right so uh, the the wavelengths get shorter and shorter and shorter and as you can see from the chart uh, a number of these lines, especially past oh, what a uh, thousand degrees, actually about 950 degrees Kelvin. Uh, uh, well, actually, I'm sorry, you'd have to get to about uh, uh, approaching 2,000 degrees before it starts giving off wavelengths beyond visible light. Okay, but certainly the sun does, doesn't it? it gives off lots of radio waves, and those are a lot longer. So that's those are all given off by the body that's uh, where the molecules are very excited and the molecules throwing off this energy in different quanta according to the uh, the specifics of the uh, the mass itself. Now, um, um, let's get to the chart itself here and look at the the uh, what we've done here is build up a chart with a lot of different elements in it so you can understand these uh, these specific elements. Um, and, and how it works. Let's look at the largest area other than the chart, the, the black lines that is, the, the red box that we've drawn faded out at the bottom so we could see everything below it. This is the infrared spectrum. Look at the purple at the top uh, of that. The infrared spectrum, 0.79 micrometers down uh, up to a thousand uh, micrometers or one millimeter. And the arrow over to the right that's there. So at just above zero degrees Kelvin, every object gives off light in that range. OK, 
In other words, one millimeter in, in length. That's actually how long it is. I can't see anything near that, can I? Okay, so by and large, the largest part of the photospectrum is given off in the infrared range. And our, and our visual, human vision, is much shorter than that. We need, we need uh, and, okay, now shift back over to the left of that chart where the visible column is. And the visible column you'll see uh, slightly below the center of that. Uh, we see from uh, 0.38 nanometers or 380, uh, um, I, um, I'm sorry, uh, microns or 380 nanometers to uh, 0 0.79 nanometers or uh, 790. I'm sorry, as 0.79 micrometers or 790 nanometers. Okay, so that's that's our visual range. But most of that energy given off by a, a any physical body in the universe is uh, more shifted into the infrared range. Okay, so now let's uh, take a single line of that and uh, discuss what it is. In this case, let's go over. Let's go to the three spectrums at the bottom. The three short spectrums, uh, not the black one, but the, the colored ones. Let's go to the brightest one. Most infrared cameras see this spectrum between 7.5 to 13 nanometers in length. Okay, that's what we see. That's what is displayed on your screen, not that frequency, of course, but it, it creates an electronic image of what it sees on the screen, and that's what it's measuring. Now let's take the black line that goes vertically from that and think about it for a second, okay? That's, that's a, a 10 nanometer uh, or a micrometer wavelength, okay? And you can see at, at exactly one temperature, okay, it gives off a specific amount. Let's go up to the red line, the, the 300 Kelvin. At 300 Kelvin, it's giving off, zing over to the left, it's giving off a little more than two, three, four, let's say f almost five watts per uh, uh, square meter of energy. It's, it's giving off that much energy in that 10, um, 10 uh, micrometer wavelength. Okay. Now, what happens if it goes up in energy? If that were, f and, and just think about it, just think about that's what you're seeing, that narrow range, narrower range than that, than that camera actually sees. So in the uh, in that that same frequency at a, a frequency of 10 micrometers, okay, if the object is 500 degrees Kelvin, it's giving off a lot more light, isn't it? Look at the scale on the left; it's logarithmic. Okay, it gives off a lot more light. Zing down to the bottom left. See that little insert? I I put that in Excel, just copied and pasted it right into there. Calculating two temperatures, okay, that's degrees, uh, that's a temperature of an object in, uh, in, in, uh, Kel in um, Celsius or in Kelvin. And forgive me if occasionally I'll, I'll, uh, I'll uh, slip up and, and, and say centigrade. Both are centigrade scales. Okay, centigrade means that there's 100 degrees or cent uh, uh, gradient between water freezing and water boiling. Okay, 100 degrees. That's what centigrade means. But this is a Celsius scale, 30, uh, and or the Kelvin scale, uh, uh, 304, gives off, uh, according to the uh, Stefan Boltzmann law, that amount of power. Okay, that's just we don't need the exact number. Uh, it's it's 8 billion units. Okay, so uh, all I did here is calculate the difference in one degree temperature off to the right, the luminous, uh, luminescence difference between those two, at one degree is 113 million units of energy. One degree difference. This is why, now go back to the line that we're looking at, 10, uh, wavelength of 10. You can see that's the line that we're measuring, is the difference in the amount of energy that's being given off by that object. And this is why we can see so precisely the difference between something that's maybe a tenth of a degree difference. This is why we do comparative infrared studies versus uh, it, it's qualitative. How does this one uh, differ from the other one versus quantitative? What is the temperature of this object? Okay, sometimes you're doing temperature. We need to know the temperature. If a, if a motor is, is uh, and on the side you'll find a, a plaque that tells you what that motor can take, what kind of environment it, it, uh, it can take, the maximum temperature. If you're approaching that, you need to, you need to find the temperature. 
specifically, but most of the time you're doing you're doing uh, um, qualitative differences, comparing one to another, one connection to another, one wire to another, uh, one one uh, uh, motor neck uh, bearing, let's say, to another motor bearing next to it. You know, how is one responding versus the other, and then what's wrong defining that? Okay, back to the spectral range. So this is the spectral range most infrared cameras see. Shift to the left, and you can see almost all objects in the world are at least warm enough to give off light in that object. I mean, you'd have to go down to negative 100 and uh, 250 degrees uh, Celsius about to get out of that range. Okay, so uh, almost everything gives off, uh, and, and cameras aren't that sensitive, you can't see anything that cold, but, but they are, you'd have to get awfully cold to get out of the range that they see. Shift to the left, black box. That is uh, water attenuation in the atmosphere or anywhere else. No camera sees that because none of that light gets to you. It's absorbed by the moisture that's naturally occurring in the air in any environment, even out in the desert. There's enough moisture to absorb that radiation. Okay, now here's something they're not going to hear. Moisture is the number one greenhouse gas that exists by the power of 200 plus. In other words, it is responsible for almost every bit of energy that's absorbed by our earth. Now greenhouse gases keep you alive. Without them, if you took the moisture out of the air, we would cool off so quickly that we would be dead in hours or if you had really good insulation, maybe a day or so. Greenhouse gases are what make life possible, and water is the number one. And there's a lot more of it than there is any other gas except nitrogen, which isn't a greenhouse gas. It doesn't, doesn't trap air at all, or heat at all. So, okay. So, the black box represents water attenuation, all of that light, some of the other is absorbed by water, but all of it is absorbed in that spectrum. Okay, and you can see how much of that there is. There's quite a bit of it, isn't there? Uh, I mean, you know, follow that column all the way up and see how much energy per uh, uh, cubic meter there is uh, in sunlight. That's a lot of energy being absorbed by the water. Okay, shifting into the left to the next spectrum, a camera in that range is called a shortwave infrared camera. Okay, it observes hotter objects. So you need to learn which cameras you might need to go see something that is hotter. Normally you can use cameras in that spectral range on the right. If you're get, getting into hotter object, you're going to do boilers or something else, you need a short wave. You need a near infrared, farther to the left, near infrared camera if you're going to be doing very hot objects that are close to giving off or actually are giving off light. What kind of an object would that be? Well, obviously, a light bulb. Less obvious would be a smelting plant, or the, the molten metal, whichever metal they're using or, or melting, is so hot that it's actually, it's actually giving off light. We've all seen that. The beautiful colors of, of light being given off, or something to do with a fire, or something like this. Now, when I was a kid, we used to see, it's, it's going to date me. Uh, it's just, when I was a kid, we used to go up to Yosemite and watch what they call the firefalls up uh, by, well, when the hotel was there, the uh, the Glacier Point Hotel, which we stayed at, there was, uh, they would start a big fire in the in the valley, and up at the top they would, they would uh, the, the uh, uh, rangers would tell stories, and then when the fire died down, they, they would get real quiet at a certain time, and they'd yell, uh, ready on the mountain, and somebody down the valley would yell, ready in the valley, and they would lift up this giant tray and spill all that ash down and you had this beautiful column of orange glowing embers uh, cascading down the side of the mountain. And um, so anyways, they stop that because they they think that the natural coal apparently is bad for the environment. A little bit they know that it's one of the best things you can add to your, uh, it, to your soils. It holds a lot of nutrient, but still they've stopped that. So, uh, uh, Note between these two 
the spectra on, on the left side there is the human body. The human body is 37 degrees C when it's healthy and normal and operating regular, and it gives off uh, you know that amount of infrared light. All of it's in the infrared range. None of the the light that we give off is in the visual spectrum. That's a little warm for us. 950 degrees of uh, Kelvin is, is a little warm for us. Okay, so um, um, uh, that's that's where we are. So. In, if, you're, if you've got complete darkness, you can still see a human body. This is why forward-looking infrared works so well when you're looking for a person who's lost. Because at night, everything's dark, all that light's gone, the visual confusion from, from the sunlight is gone, and what you can see with that camera is that person's body giving off infrared light. Okay, And it gives off quite a bit. Now. I was on a, a um, ship, <laughs> a Navy ship, uh, in, in an area that was had pirates. We um, um, shut down the ship. Uh, certain security measures were put into place. And uh, I realized suddenly that I had a camera that could see somebody in the dark a long way off. So I went up at night, about 9 o'clock, to the captain's uh, cabin and said, Captain, can I show you something? Let me take you to the bridge and show you what this camera can do for your security at night. And so we went up to the bridge, and there's several people outside operating searchlights. And uh, we, we uh, used my camera to show him the uh, person standing on the bow of the ship. Now, I, I waited until the light was turned away from us, couldn't see that, but I, I, I showed that person that was uh, standing on the bow of the ship and he looked like a light bulb. In this black field, this bright red object was found. And I said, this device can see through the fog, see through the bank, see through the distance. It can see the the, uh, the rifles that are used on a pirate boat that are coming at you, possibly, because they're being held by people. They're usually a little bit warmer. They don't cool off as fast as the air did as it got dark. Uh, the, certainly, the engine was giving off a lot of heat, and the people inside, you can see that from a long distance. So it's a security measure that I was encouraging them to take. So even the human body gives off light, okay? And you can see that I could tell the difference between the human body or something else because of Planck's curves there on the chart, couldn't I? Because I can, my camera will measure the amount of radiation in a given wavelength and then calculate using Stefan Boltzmann's law exactly what that temperature is with a very fine degree of accuracy. Now you will notice on this that off to the to the far right ab above the ICADS emblem, I've extended that out to absolute zero. And I have to admit, whoever created the original chart that is Planck curves themselves, a little bit off on the one at 100K. That line should be extended off to the uh, to the right a little bit farther. But you can also see just from those three lines that are off to the right, one at uh, at uh, that that ends at the the original line of the chart. That uh, the 100 degree K or 100 K uh, Kelvin line, that the line does shift a little bit to the left, and this isn't unusual in physics at all. If you took a distribution curve, just a bell-shaped curve, and use that to describe the water temperatures in a typical, let's say, a glass of water, a glass of water sitting on the counter at 70 degrees. Okay, 70 degrees really represents the mean temperature of that water, and in the distribution curve, it's the temperature at the top there, isn't it? Top of the curve. In reality, there are molecules at any given instant that are freezing cold and hardly moving at all. A few of them that are almost, almost at, at zero Kelvin, uh, but, but that would last only a microsecond. But, but, uh, but the, the, uh, as you get towards uh, you also have some that are that are hot hot enough to evaporate. Don't see if you let the water sit there; it evaporates. It means it has to be uh, 210 degrees Fahrenheit or 100 degrees Celsius, right? So there, that whole distribution curve exists in that water. If you chill that water colder and colder, the way you describe that in that distribution curve was crush it from the left to the right, so the curve becomes steeper and closer and closer and closer towards freezing until it's freezing, your, the peak energy would be at uh, a zero uh, Kelvin or, or 32 degrees Fahrenheit. If you make it hotter, you pull it to the left and make it longer, make a broader distribution curve. And then at a certain point, you get away and you'll find almost no molecules at all. I mean, if you could take the temperature at an instant of any molecule. No molecules at all in the in the freezing range. 
okay, because it gets pulled off to the sides, it gets stretched. So that's not too unusual. But again, in, in the entire range we're interested in, oh, uh, let me fill out the rest of my theory, because if that's right, no one else has ever described this. If I'm right that it is black body, re I'm sorry, uh, black energy and dark matter, uh, dark energy, dark matter, that are, uh, that fill up the mass of the universe, and I don't see any way around that, and that light is actually traveling through it. In other words, luminiferous ether, ether theory was correct. That which light travels through, okay? If it is uh, dark energy, dark matter, and that's what's causing the waves, okay, then what happens in my theory, at, and this is unproved, no, no one's approved it, my theory is that at absolute zero, when no more light is given off, the matter actually disintegrates into dark energy. As far as we would be concerned, we, it would, it, you, you, the matter would be gone, because we don't have any way of sensing that. If we did, we'd be able to see it again. But that preserves first, second, third laws of thermodynamics, explains the zeroth law of thermodynamics, and so uh, that, that's, that's my theory. But okay, this is what happens. Energy stops giving off, and you have no energy. E equals M. Energy equals mass. If you have no energy, Where's your mass? You have no mass. Okay, now, it's a little bit different when you get into that realm because now you're talking about dark energy, dark matter. That's a, it's, it's, it's a lot lighter, a lot finer. We can't detect it yet. You can only calculate uh, the reason that it should be there. Okay, so all theory completely, you can forget that. You don't need to remember that. But okay, so here, here you have, again, Planck curves explaining uh, that, that the warmer an object is, the more, you can just Stefan Boltzmann in the lower left hand corner, the more energy is given off by each uh, unit of area, be it a, a, a um, square millimeter or a square meter uh, or, you know, a football field. Uh, you know, uh, each unit of area is going to give off more and more in any given frequency and the peak is going to be calculated by Wien's Law. Look up there in the yellow line at the top, representing sunlight, Wien's Law is the frequency maximum that is given off, okay, that is what frequency is given off by, by the object will tell you its temperature, right? So the frequency maximum can be calculated by dividing 2,989 by the, the temperature in Kelvin, and that will tell you the, the frequency of the, uh, the light that's the maximum uh, amount of light that's being given off. Okay, remember now, each frequency is a very specific narrow range. Go to the visual spectrum, look at yellow, and, and, and how much is given off. You can see that as far as this line, let's just talk about these temperatures that are on here. Uh, as far as these are concerned, only at 1,000 degrees do we get any of that yellow light given off at all. 1,000 Kelvin, of course. Uh, um, okay, the, this for, for uh, and this is... Uh, pre more precise, it's the only one that's really precise here, is uh, that's 726.85 degrees Celsius or 1340.33 degrees Fahrenheit. There's where you start giving off yellow light and the more of it you have, the hotter it is. See, in other words, at 1000 degrees you're not giving off very much, are you? Okay, but at, at 5700 degrees you're giving off a lot of it. That's what we're looking at. That's the Planck curve. That's why the Planck curve, in conjunction with Wien's law and in conjunction with Stefan Boltzmann law, can calculate exactly the temperature that you're going to need if you're using an infrared camera to describe a piece of equipment and how warm it is and how warm it is compared to something else in comparative uh, qualitative or quantitative thermography. So that's the chart. Study this, turn this off, and look at that chart and get to know it so you understand what it is and what it means so you can explain to somebody else why we can see maybe two-tenths of a degree difference between one object and another, why it's so sensitive and so specific. Now, let's say you've got a hot connection. There's, a, there's something wrong with an electrical connection. It's going to start building heat and very quickly, once that, en that energy is flowing through it, once power's on, you're going to see a difference in the temperature between it and the object next to it with the same current flowing through. 
because of Stefan Boltzmann's law. And you can see again, 113 million units of difference in luminosity based on one degree difference. That's a lot of light. Okay, remember, this is the, the chart on the left is logarithmic. So that's, that's you know, the, these, these um, um, Planck curves should be much steeper than this. If we, if we didn't make it logarithmic, you'd see a much steeper curve. And the, the, the curves on the left would be a lot shallower. But still, a lot of light difference, a lot of energy difference, and this is why we can see these differences and measure them accurately, and why this is becoming such an important technology to understanding how to keep equipment operating safely and efficiently and prolong its life.